Disciple Up, episode number 210. I have to preach on vaccines? This is Disciple Up, the Disciple Empowering Podcast, where psychology, science, the real world, sin, self, and culture meet head on, and scripture rules. If you're a follower of Christ looking to grow, or are looking for some biblical answers, then get ready, because it's time to Disciple Up. Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. This is Louis. Welcome to Disciple Up. I'm your host for the big show. I am the also the senior pastor of River Church in Parker, Arizona. If you happen to be tuning in for the very first time, I'm glad that you're here and hope that you will stay tuned through the whole thing and enjoy the big podcast. Now today we're... Well, uh, let me explain the background to today's show because it's actually relevant to the program. Um, and I'm probably going to have to do a little shifting when I talk to you because uh, last a week ago today, actually, a week ago this morning, I woke up after a wonderful Sunday night's sleep on Monday morning with uh, a gigantic pain in my knee, which it didn't take me too long to really figure out. It was gout. Now, I got gout way back in 2013, my last night in Myanmar. Woke up at 3 in the a.m. with an incredible pain in the big toe of my right foot. It was swollen. It was red. It was hurting. So I got to fly across, halfway across the globe, walk across international airports, limping on this thing, which hurt like a son of a gun. And when I finally got to Phoenix, oh, yay, they misplaced our luggage. So I stood in a line for another half hour to an hour to get that worked out. And then my sister said, hey, try the natural cure. So we did that, and that went nowhere. If you get gout, do not try the natural cures. Trust me. <clears throat> so I went to a physician's assistant and got some allopurinol and took care of it. Well, Monday morning. And by the way, when I say took care of it, it did not happen overnight, but it took like about a month, I think three weeks, something like that. So I gimped around hoping it might go away or whatever, and finally went to see the doctor and he gave me allopurinol and something else and another drug which they which my pharmacy can't get for reasons that are beyond me and so here I am. Now what does this have to do with preaching on vaccinations you ask? Well that's a good question. Because what I want to do is read to you and comment on this article I found in Christianity Today and um sort of tied them together because in my mind at least my fevered brain so those of you that think I've lost it here maybe you're right just chalk it up Chalk it up to gout. And remember, there is no doubt you don't want gout. All right. This this article is by Kate Shelnut, May 10th, 2021. White evangelical pastors hesitant to preach vaccines. Advocates say more subtle approaches and one-on-one engagement may actually do more to inform the unvaccinated without further dividing the faithful. Now, I have to tell you, When I saw this headline, the first thing I thought was, why on earth would I preach vaccines? What? Is that what I'm called to do? Kind of missed it if that's what I was called to do. Then, of course, I noticed the white evangelical. Now, I know, you know, this is from, taken from, Surveys And, of course, they have to break surveys down into every possible subcategory. White, black, purple, green, blue, straight, gay, male, female, old, young, you know, whatever. But um, I'm getting a little tired of this uh, approach I'm seeing in Christianity Today, where it seems like white evangelical pastors, whoever they may be, would probably include me, Although I don't like the term evangelical, but that's just because it kind of doesn't mean anything anymore. Seem to be taking a little more than their fair share of abuse here. So here's the article. As COVID-19 vaccination rates slowed this spring, Americans' attention turned toward groups less likely to get the shot, including white evangelicals. Now, Americans' Americans' attention did not turn towards white evangelicals. I'm sorry. Come on. Most Americans couldn't define a white evangelical if their life depended on it. Back to the article, black Protestants were initially among the more skeptic, most skeptical towards the vaccine, but they grew significantly more open to it during the first few months of the year, while white evangelicals' hesitancy held steady. With African Americans, many 
credit robust campaigns targeting black neighborhoods, launching vaccination clinics in black churches, and convening discussions featuring prominent black Christian voices for reducing rates of hesitancy. So, for those eager to see higher levels of vaccination, the question became, are white evangelical leaders doing enough to engage their own? The latest poll from the Kaiser Family Foundation, a nonprofit research organization focused on health issues, found that as of the end of April, white evangelicals, 54 percent, were about as likely to have received the COVID-19 vaccination vaccine as the country overall, 56 percent. Yeah, 2 percent difference is not statistically you know, important. The difference comes with attitudes among the unvaccinated. White evangelicals are half as likely as Americans overall to say they plan to get the shot ASAP. And 20% say they definitely won't be getting the shot seven percentage points lower than the rest of the country. Most evangelical churches in the country span a range of perspectives on vaccination, which makes it difficult for pastors to know when or how to address the topic. I know pastors who won't even mention masks because people would leave. I'd say vaccines are even more sensitive, said Dan DeWitt, who directs the Center for Biblical Apologetics and Public Christianity at Cedarville University. Pastors feel so constrained, they want to take care of their people, but they know one careless comment could cost them, he said. Issues, the issues dividing the country in 2020 divided churches too, while pastors tried to adapt worship services and continue to provide spiritual care for the suffering and mourning, Congregational disputes over politics, racial issues, and COVID-19 responses spiked. Church leaders fielded comments for being too cautious or not cautious enough, with members threatening to leave or simply making the move over reopening plans. After a year like that, some don't feel comfortable publicly endorsing or rejecting the shot. Maybe they would if tensions weren't so high. Even pastors who personally trust the vaccine would and would recommend it, may worry it's not their topic to preach on or that doing so would unsettle their congregations. Curtis Chang, the former pastor and Fuller Theological Seminary senior fellow behind ChristiansandTheVaccine.com, says pastors are in a tough position. Quote, they are really stuck. They're feeling paralyzed and muzzled, he said. He challenges them to think beyond Sunday sermons to other ways to engage the issue. Chang's site and campaign offers a slate of informative videos for Christians and for pastors in particular. His message to those leading evangelical congregations, quote, don't feel like you need to preach on this from the pulpit. Look for other subtle ways to exercise your influence, unquote. And that's what Kentucky minister Carl Canterbury did. He told the Lexingtary Herald leader, Lexington, I'm sorry, Herald leader, that he wouldn't address the vaccine from the pulpit, but knowing that vaccine and misinformation is rampant in his small town in East Kentucky, he would talk to fellow members at Lulun, Llewellyn, L-O-U-E-L-L-E-N, Pentecostal Church, about why he went ahead and got the Johnson & Johnson shot. So many people think it's a conspiracy, and they want to know, are you getting it? The day I had my shot, I had four members in our church to stop by and ask, did I take the shot? And I told him, yes. Canterbury said, noting that every pastor in the small town of Closplint, Closplint, C-L-O-S-P-L-I-N-T, had also been vaccinated because I did, they did. Hmm, okay. Uh, I just, let's not even comment. I, well, okay, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> Is he saying because he did it, all the other pastors did? I don't Maybe he's really influential. I don't know. Sounds a little egotistical, but what do I know? What happened at his Pentecostal church where people change their mind after hearing a pastor or church member talk about why they got the shot is a promising trend. And it makes sense. Though many people were eager to immediately roll up their sleeves for the COVID-19 jab, having questions about the new vaccines or wanting to wait for others to get the shot is actually a common natural response wrote epidemiologist Gideon, oh boy, Meyerwitz Katz. It's also worth reiterating that most of these hesitant people do eventually get vaccinated. Sometimes they are late, sometimes they take a while to convince, but most of them are reasonable people worried about something they don't fully understand, he said. Most can be reassured with time and adequate information shared by medical providers. 
The PRRI found in March that among churchgoers who are waiting to see if they'll get the vaccine, nearly half of white Protestants said engagement from their faith community, either seeing others get vaccinated or hosting events like forums or clinics, would make them more likely to do so. The poll also found that white evangelical Protestants who attend church more often are slightly less likely to want to get the vaccine. In March, 43% said they had done so or planned to ASAP than those who attend less often, 43%. Among black Protestants, it was the opposite. Church attendance was correlated with greater openness to the vaccine. Chang suggested that the black church tradition has primed them to see health as a community issue and that black churchgoers are more likely to trust the model set by their pastors, many of of whom signed up for the vaccine early in the public-facing vaccination campaign. As vaccine access expanded in March and April, many prominent pastors touted their decision to get the vaccine, such as Southern Baptist Convention President J.D. Greer, who posted a hashtag sleeve up selfie on Twitter. Others opened their churches to vaccination sites, such as First Baptist Dallas Pastor Robert Jeffries, a former evangelical advisor to President Trump. But many white evangelicals see vaccination not as a mandate of their faith, but as a matter of personal conscience. It's between them and their families, them and their health care providers, or them and God, or I might add, maybe all three. There are a few who embrace conspiracy theories about the vaccine and the coronavirus of the sort promulgated by evangelical leaders such as Eric Metaxas and some who claim, and I don't know what Eric says, so I kind of hate to just throw that out there. But if I'll get a chance, we'll do some checking on that in a minute. Uh, And some who claim the inoculation is somehow connected to the mark of the beast. More commonly, though, evangelicals who are hesitant to receive the vaccine are resisting what they saw as cultural pressure to take their freedom to make an individual decision. Um, Okay, Eric Metaxas on his Twitter page. Fact, if you find looking at the facts and discussing them civilly to be incendiary... Perhaps you aren't thinking clearly. Can you read this and think about it? Coronavirus vaccine, blah, blah, blah. 18 reasons why I won't be getting a COVID vaccine. So he wrote an article on his blog here, and he gives some of his reasons. Um, Vaccine makers are immune from liability. The checkered past of vaccine companies... I'm just going to read some of these titles. I won't get into the details. The ugly history of attempts to make coronavirus vaccines uh, the data gaps submitted by the FDA to the FDA by the vaccine makers no access to the raw data from the trials no long term safety testing no informed consent under reporting of adverse reactions and death vaccines do not stop transmission or infection uh, and number 10 people are catching COVID after being fully vaccinated and he goes on so okay so I don't know that I would call that. Um, oh, shoot. Did I just do that? I think I wait. <laughs> oh, no, it's right here. All right. Sorry. They tricked me. There we go. Ah, I don't know that I would call that uh, a conspiracy theory. But, okay, whatever. See, this is why when people complain about the the fighting and the stuff that's going on around this, here we have a Christian writing a Christian article talking about other Christians with whom she clearly disagrees. And then she says that he's a conspiracy theorist. Well, I don't know that all those things or even very many of those things are actually conspiracy theorists. They're concerns. And I don't know the truth or the untruth about most of them. And I don't really care because I'm vaccinated, so it doesn't matter to me. Uh, It's too late for me now, people. (laughs) Whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen. But, um, um, you know, it it I don't think it's helping us by by labeling his apparently sincere concerns as conspiracy theories. You don't think he's right? That's fine, but you know why do we have to call it that name? All right, back to the article. Chang said that for some, the attitude is attitude is I made my decision. Don't tell me what to do. Or I prayed about it. God told me not to take the vaccine. Therefore, end of discussion. Christian messaging around. The COVID-19 vaccine has employed a variety of theological reasonings, 
vaccination is a way to take advantage of the blessings and protections God gives us through science. It's an expression of love and care for our neighbors, especially those who are medically vulnerable. It allows us to participate in God's healing of the world. As stances on masking and vaccination become uh, conflated with ideological positions, evangelicals are also sensitive about to how they talk about these issues in faith terms. At Madison Baptist Church in Georgia, Pastor Griffin Goldridge models wearing a mask to church and prays during services to thank God for the vaccine and for the effective treatments against the coronavirus. That sends a message, he says, but he also believes that he's not a public health expert and people may have good reason for waiting to vaccinate. Good point. Quote, Christ tells us to love your neighbor as yourself, and then the Apostle Paul tells us to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I think that the, those are two things we need to balance. I don't think it is reasonable, Goldridge said, for people to say in all cases universally to love your neighbor, you must follow this or that precaution, and you must get vaccinated at this time. These things are complicated. Reasonable people are going to come to different conclusions. Despite uh, assumptions about COVID-19 approaches in a rural South, 30-year-old Goldridge still says the vast majority of his church were eager to get vaccinated, so much so that they helped him find an appointment to get the shot, which happened to be. Being a pastor and being part of the Christian community has always involved designating between matters of gospel importance and individual freedom. Lately, those issues have come up in particularly visible fraught ways, fraught ways, okay, uh, as the country takes on the pandemic responses to the vaccines. DeWitt said at Cedarville, DeWitt at Cedarville, I'm sorry, points out how much tone and perception matter when it comes to how churches address COVID-19, what some people see as an act of caring, others see as overreach. How do we stay committed to the gospel and committed to this message that we care for body and soul, he asked. If there is no good evidence that the vaccine is hurtful, and if there is evidence that the vaccine is helpful, then church leaders should be vocal, not for virtue signaling, but because it's an actually good, it's an actual good and leads to flourishing. DeWitt also sees the attitudes over the coronavirus responses as tied to deeper issues in the American church, where he worries too many people are conflating scriptural identity and political identity. We're in a culture in which things that are superficial are seen as deeper loyalties, he said. The fact that American evangelicalism is so fragmented that the big-name ministry leader who inspires one group of evangelicals may totally turn off another makes it a challenge to engage the movement as a whole, even when calling on shared beliefs and values. Quote, the recipe here is information plus trust, unquote, Chang said. He went on to say we can provide information, the trust has to come from a person who's sending this along and saying to their friend or their church or their family, hey, would you be willing to take a look? And that's the article. So wrote Kate Shelnut, Christianity Today. The link will be in the show notes but um, to this episode. But <sighs> my response to this is I have not preached on the vaccine. I am not going to preach on the vaccine. A, most of the people in my church have gotten it. B, uh, I don't think that's the – I think the article when we get down there is actually right. It's not the best way to communicate this. It's not the best way to approach this. And you only get to preach if you're – if you preach every Sunday of the year. So let's say you get two weeks off. You're only preaching 50 weeks a year. You have 50 times a year to stand in that pulpit and influence people. Okay, they're going to see probably the average person a lot more than 50 commercials, either see and or hear or read. A lot more than 50 commercials every day, right? They're going to have all kinds of conversations. They're going to hear on the radio, on the TV, talk shows, opinions, blah, 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 blah. So you've got all these influences smashing into the people of God constantly. Un, un, unremittingly the pressure from our culture cranking up every day harder and harder to make you conform and I've got 50 times 50 chances or actually less but let's just say 50 just as a nice round number uh, a year to speak to the largest probably the largest group I'll speak to all week which would be your you know, congregation on Sunday morning 
And I don't think this even gets close to making the bar on that. And I don't even think that it gets close to finding out what's to to me to matching the I'm having trouble talking to matching the scripture when it says what we're supposed to be preaching on, because, you know, we're supposed to be preaching on Christ, as Paul said. I knew nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. Um, I suppose you could get the vaccines from there somewhere, but it'd be a stretch. Not that pastors aren't famous for stretching, because they certainly are. But, and I've done my share of that, unfortunately, probably in my career so far. But, you know, we've got to preach the gospel. We've got we've to teach scripture. We've got to help people learn how to deal with the big issues in our, in our culture that then affect our decisions. If, I believe if you can get people to think biblically and know their scriptures and understand it and be open to the, to the, to the ministry of the Holy Spirit— they will then be equipped to make these kind of decisions, if not on their own, mostly so. And then, of course, you have all the rest of the week to talk to them, send them emails, text them, chat with them. I mean, I had a lot of people come and talk to me about this since, you know, COVID became a thing uh, about it, you know, a little over a year ago. And um, and that's what I did. And I was honest with people because when the vaccine was first announced, I was not exactly jumping up and down. And when they released it, I, I was in the second age group that was available to the first age group, but I had all the first responders and teachers and those, that, those guys. But the first group was slightly older than me, you know, and then the second group came open, which I was in. And then you know, I just didn't do anything. I didn't do anything until um, March, mid March, because uh, actually, yeah, yeah. Around mid March, because I was waiting and I was watching what was happening. I was trying to look at the data as um, objectively as possible, given my complete and total lack of knowledge on immunology or however you say that word. I can't even pronounce the word, much less know the topic. But, you know, you do what you can. You listen to people who you know and respect and try and boil all this down into something. And then, as you know, because I've, if you've heard my past podcasts on this, I've talked about this, I... The final thing that pushed me over the edge was, look, as a pastor, I deal with people all the time. It, if this helps them to relax around me and feel safe with me, and if this all but guarantees I won't pass on the virus to them, which it appears to do from everything I've seen, then I'm going to get the vaccine because that's going to make me more effective servant of, of Jesus, and that's going to make me um, able to minister better. And, you know, if it makes me a good example, too, that's that's fine. Um, but I haven't told anybody you should get the vaccine, except a few people I knew who were really sick, who were in their 80s, with have one lung, that kind of thing. Those people, definitely. But everybody else, hey, I talked to them about it, shared different points of view and information with them, and then I, I, I left it to them because I think as Christian leaders, shouldn't we be trusting God? to work in their hearts and lead them to the right decision. But now, of course, we don't do that, which is also shown in the way we approach, say, amongst the churches who do politics, the way they approach politics is if you go to, to liberal church over here, you're a terrible Christian if you didn't vote for this guy and believe in these things and blah, blah, blah. If you go to the conservative church over there, conservative church says you're a terrible christian if you voted for that guy and did those things <laughs> instead of teaching scripture and letting people figure it out for themselves see the the one problem i have with this one of the problems let me put it that way that i have with this article it's not a terrible article but that i would that i would just point out is you know it's not my job as a pastor to run anybody's life I'm not your daddy and I'm not your mama, that's for sure. Even in this age of changing gender, no, I still can't be your mama. And I, my job is to present the truth and teach the truth and preach the truth. It's not to make people's decisions for them. Jesus never did that. Look at Jesus. With the rich young ruler, he laid it out and the rich young ruler walked away and what did he do? He chased after him and say, now, listen, this is for your best. You need to do. No, he didn't do that, did he? He just let him go. Because the, one of the greatest gifts of God is free will. 
it is a source of amazing good on this planet, and it is a source of almost unfathomable and appalling evil. And it all comes from the same place. We get to choose what we are going to do. We get to choose what we're going to believe. We get to choose. If you choose not to be vaccinated and you die from COVID-19, that would be a terrible thing. But that's your choice to make. God has never authorized me to take that choice from you unless you're a minor or unless you're mentally unable you know, to take care of yourself. In which case then, of course, with situations like that, you make decisions for people, you know, if they're not, you know, capable of doing that. But other than that, that's how it's supposed to work. So if you think I'm giving up a Sunday or two to preach on some vaccine or um, <laughs> something like that, when when we've got so much happening and the people are so, I think the people in our culture are so... <sighs> I don't know if they're hungry for the word of God, but there's such a drought for it. There's such a need for it because so many people just aren't really giving them much from the word of God when they listen to them speak. Yes, they make them feel good, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that, but um, they're not really meeting the needs that are there. So um, I, yeah, I just think that uh, I'm not going to do it. Now, if somebody else wants to go preach on... uh, The vaccination, if another pastor wants to do that, fine, go ahead. I don't think you should. I think it's a mistake. But, you know, it's your ministry. It's not mine. And you don't answer to me. And I don't answer to you. And neither one of us answered this to Kate Shelnut. So um, there you go. We have to be willing to give ourselves freedom in Christ. Now, what does all this have to do, (laughs) you might ask, with with gout or any kind of physical suffering you may be undergoing. Well, it's, again, it goes back to choice. It's freedom of choice. I had the choice of when to call the doctor. I waited because that's what I do because I'm not real bright. Probably should have called him on Monday. Didn't. Oh, well. Live and learn. I didn't need somebody, though, you know, trying to make that decision for me or dragging me down to the doctor or anything else. That would have been wrong. There is pain and suffering in this world, and we all know that. And how we respond to it for ourselves, you know, is up to ourselves. Now, when you start getting children involved in things like that, then, of course, the equation gets a lot more complicated. But that's it, basically. So, no, I don't think we should be preaching on this. I think we should be preaching the gospel. I think we should be preaching God's word. I think we should be trying to apply it to people's hearts. I think we should be encouraging people to get into the word, read it, study it, meditate on it, to let the Holy Spirit illuminate it for them and and, and then begin to live it out. That's what we should be doing. We need to be discipling and, and forming people to be like Christ, not running around trying to you know, be the Red Cross or whatever. Um, sure, we help if we can. Sure, if they had needed a spot, and you know, if the county health department had come to me and said, could we use your fellowship hall or whatever during the week for giving COVID shots, I would have said, sure, no problem. They didn't, but if they had, they would have, they would have had it. No questions asked, no doubt about it. Um, we've, you know, helped out the county before with a couple times with things. And, you know, We'll continue to because we love our community and we want to bless them and help them. But but that doesn't take away from the main message and the main thrust and the main thing, which has to be the gospel. It has to be, folks. The gospel and all its implications and all its meanings and everything else. And so this is going to be a short Disciple Up this week because that's really all I had to say. And um, why should I say more if that's all I got? So I hope that this was a blessing to you. I hope you'll um, uh, get in touch with me. Let me know what you think. Either way, I suppose taking this up, I'm going to get a lot of people mad. But, you know, whatever. Uh, I'm not here to make you happy. (laughs) So if you're unhappy with me, that's okay, too. I'm trying to please the Lord and do the best I can, and that's what we're doing here. 
So if you do want to get in touch, though, there's two basic ways. You can email me, louie, L-O-U-I-E, at discipleup.org, or you can go to the web, or you can go to the Facebook page, I'm sorry, facebook.com slash discipleup, and leave a comment there. Now, I have a website, discipleup.org, where you'll find the show notes for this episode and all the episodes and all the show notes. There is no way there to contact me. And the reason there isn't is because I don't want 8,000 spam emails flooding me. So... This is how I've just chosen to do it. So email me at discipleup.org, Louie, L-O-U-I-E. Go to the Facebook page. Or if you know me then you know personally, then you can just get in touch with me any old way you please. So thank you so much for listening. I hope this was a blessing to you or at least got you thinking a little bit and stirred you up a little bit because that's always good. So until next time, God bless you. Take care. And remember that every time is a good time to disciple up. So long. Disciple Up, the Empowering Disciples podcast is written, produced, directed, in as much as there's any direction to this thing at all, edited every once in a while, and paid for by Louis. It's his personal ministry, and it's not connected to Christ Church on the River. CCR does not sponsor, pay for, or necessarily approve the content found therein. The theme music for Disciple Up is Hot Wheels by Varensky. Yes, Louis actually paid for the rights to this very cool piece of music, so don't worry, and please call off the lawyers, as he's busy enough without having to deal with all that. All opinions expressed during Disciple Up are Louis and Louis alone. They do not necessarily represent those of our sponsor, the Lord Jesus Christ. However, where the opinions, thoughts, impressions, and feelings shared are in line with God's Word and faithfully represent what our Lord says in His Holy Word, the Bible, then they are representative of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're wondering how the heck you're supposed to know this, remember, God tells you to test all things. Hold on to the truth. It's up to you to do the due diligence that God commands, so do it. Don't whine about it, and don't complain about how hard it is. Don't blame me for it. Disciple Up, and do what you know you're supposed to do. If you'd like to know more about Louis or Disciple Up, please go to discipleup.org and check out everything you find there. Or not, it's completely up to you. Disciple Up, the Empowering Disciples podcast will, God willing, publish an episode every week covering different areas of concern to disciples of Jesus. If that's important to you, then please subscribe on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, or another one of the many podcast aggregators available to you. If it's not, then don't. If you'd like to get in touch, please email Louis at louis at discipleup.org. God bless you.